Today I'll talk about uh, neural simulation, particularly some aspects that are perhaps the most relevant for, for this embodied workshop. All right, so at NVIDIA, the vision for the future is 3D, right? So the vision is that anything that is built will be visualized. Anything that moves will someday be autonomous. And then anything autonomous will be simulated, right? Which means that there is really need to power large-scale simulation that is both uh, physically accurate and can handle really complex virtual worlds. So towards this, NVIDIA has been building this um, uh, real-time visualization collaboration simulation platform called NVIDIA Omniverse um, that has been released. So I really invite all of you to check it out. Um, and it essentially connects all these different 3D modeling tools that are already available. You know, Blender, Maya, Unreal Engine, anything can be plugged into Omniverse and the scenes that you're editing in this original 3D software can be visualized and simulated in some Omniverse. Another really cool aspect of Omniverse is that it could allows you to very easily plug in new tech, um, be it a new rendering algorithm, algorithm, you know, some, some faster physics or any AI algorithm that you may develop. Um, and, you know, and the command is just like a Python interface that you can plug in and qu very quickly you can have a demo on this uh, great visualization platform. In fact, a lot of the work that's coming out of my NVIDIA lab is actually demoed in this way in Omniverse. So um, you, you, uh, you can imagine that this kind of visualization platform can power all sorts of downstream applications from architecture, entertainment, you know, like film, um, but one very important uh, uh, domain, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today, is driving simulation and generally simulation for robotics. Right? We know that for safety critical applications, such as you know, robotics or driving in particular, you need to have simulation. You need to test your vehicle against all sorts of different challenging scenarios before you can you know, have some hope of uh, validating that this is actually um, going to work in the real world, right? And simulation is great. It gives you all the control that you want uh, in terms of, you know, the kind of maps you want to drive in, how many vehicles you're going to put on the road, uh, about, you know, their speeds, dynamics, weather, and so on. Uh, so this uh, drive scene, the latest update, was revealed uh, a month ago, I think, by Jensen and GTC. And I think it's really just kind of a work of of technology and art. So everything is rendered uh, real time, photorealistic, so ray traced. Uh, physics is all computed real time, all the lights, dynamic lights, everything is real time. So for the ego algorithm that's running on this little car over here, um, you know, or driving in simulation or driving in the real world should be the same, or at least in terms of uh, the, the sensor data coming in, uh, it should be the same speed. And NVIDIA has been really kind of honing in on simulating perception as well, right? Because you want to simulate the entire stack, both perception and, and then, you know, planning, so end-to-end -end simulation. Awesome. Um, so, you know, Omniverse is uh, being, uh, the, the main effort is being run by my manager, actually. So uh, we are very motivated to create research that is going to kind of power some of this content creation for Omniverse or, you know, driving simulation is being one of the domains. So we've been working on all sorts of different things from, you know, synthesizing worlds, synthesizing layouts of objects that you can place in these worlds, uh, scalable synthesis of assets or reconstruction of assets from all sorts of different modalities, um, AR, VR applications, and then, you know, some sort of a more artistic content creation uh, helper tools. Um, like stabilization. And of course, you know, there is a static component of content creation, so how the scenes look like, but there is also the dynamic component, which means that we need to be able to simulate behaviors, you know, traffic models, uh, simulate pedestrians and other dynamic participants of the scenes, um, and also animate, for example, humans in realistic ways. A lot of the research that we're doing in 3D deep learning has, you know, some utility functions that you can abstract, and we have been releasing all that through this Kaolin SDK, which also has a plugin into Omniverse where you can visualize your research results. So please check it out. All right, 
So today I'm gonna let's talk about it. I'm gonna talk about two different projects that I felt are maybe perhaps the most relevant for this workshop on embodied AI. And the first topic I wanted to mention is on traffic simulation, right? Which means that yes, I have this wonderful simulator that looks, uh, you know, super photorealistic. But one of the really hard challenges to solve is simulating how the vehicles, and not just vehicles, pedestrians or anything that moves, basically, how they actually move. Um, and this, I, we've been working for this for some time now, and it turns out a very, very challenging problem, right? So what do you need to solve? This, this traffic models need to be realistic. So they shouldn't be like a robot. They should be like, you know, humans should behave like humans. They need to be reactive. So if my ego vehicle is making an, an action, then everyone should be reacting in realistic ways to this action. It needs to be controllable because I want to specify the exact scenario I want to test in my vehicle in, uh, which means that I want to place certain behaviors on other vehicles um, and I'm expecting them to actually behave that way. Um, and of course it needs to be diverse, right? I don't want each other vehicle be perfect in some definition of perfect. It needs to be human-like, which means aggressive, cautious, distracted, all that needs to be captured by these traffic models. And of course it needs to be rich enough. So it needs to cover edge cases, uh, right? So if I want to simulate scissor overtaking, cutting into a lane, I should be able to do that. Okay. So my talk today is not really going to answer all this. I think this is a really tough problem and I'm really inviting the audience to work on this. Um, but um, hopefully it's gonna, it's gonna, you know, unveil some questions at least. So how have people been uh, kind of approaching this problem, right? So maybe the most common one has been used in, in games, which is, you know, some sort of behavior tree, some, some game logic that governs how all the behaviors of the vehicles are um, created, um, which means that it's very scripted. It's perhaps less human-like, right? So someone has really kind of had to create how all these vehicles are going to behave in different situations, which means that it's hard to re-simulate certain scenarios, right? If I just, if I encounter some intervention, I want to re-simulate it, I now need to go and manually kind of script all these different behaviors, right? In self-driving, people have been mainly tackling this from an imitation learning perspective, where I have recorded tons of real data, and I want to kind of mimic those trajectories that cars or other um, participants make, All right? So this has some advantages for sure, because this is going to be more human-like, but it also has some problems. So here was kind of us trying to do this a year ago, uh, the CBPR paper. This is just like purely imitation learning policies that are rolling out on new scenes um, maps and that, that they have also been trained on new scenes. So if you kind of look long enough, um, you're, you're gonna see that longer rollers always kind of lead into problems. There's either collisions, there's some sort of illegal maneuvers that these vehicles tend to take. And at least for new scenes, because not all the state has been annotated, so you don't know the state of traffic signs and so on, that kind of causality hasn't been learned by this imitation learn policies. So it's a good step, but it's definitely not something amazing we can just directly use in a driving simulator. And of course, the question is, and what, what do I do, right? So yes, I can post process, I can maybe avoid some of those collisions. I can maybe make some sort of imitation learning with RL. Um, but then as soon as I have RL, how do I encode reward functions? How do I encode traffic rules that all these vehicles need to follow? There's just so many of them, right? And it just becomes a very daunting problem. So in this project, we kind of try to take a, a little bit of a different perspective on kind of driving. And we're going to investigate social driving. So we're going we're gonna to formulate driving as an optimization problem uh, in a multi-agent RL framework. And in particular, we're going to try to design you know, the most simple uh, reward functions or objectives that this agent should be optimizing as a whole. In particular, we're going to train these agents to travel from A to B, so from start to end, as quickly as possible without co co uh, colliding. Okay, so you can think of this as you know the basic function that probably every driver is optimizing for. 
And you know, if you think of this old era where you know cars just started out, very few vehicles were on the road. Maybe this was actually the objective everyone was optimizing. And then, as there were more and more vehicles, more and more you know, roads, and so on, and then traffic rules kind of emerged as a way to prevent accidents. So we want to we want to basically analyze the emergence of those rules. So what happens? If I have this very simple objective function, but I add many different agents, which is basically how the roads look like today. And what if I purposely add noise to perception? All right, so arguably human eyes are not perfect, particularly not at night in different weather. So, you know, how, how, how does that affect the learned behaviors of this just very simple objective function? And we're gonna try to analyze, you know, the behaviors that emerge in this environment. All right, so this is just a very simple setup. So moral multi-agent reinforcement learning. So how we're formulating this is there's a single policy that's going to be shared by all agents here denoted by pi. The observation is going to be kind of like a, a LIDAR, a mini LIDAR, where there's like a equiangular uh, beams coming out of this agent. Uh, we're limiting the distance that the agent sees by 50 meters. And we're gonna be adding some noise along this race kind of mimic a noisy perception, um, right? So each agent is going to see just like some local uh, local environment from where it is. Then the reward for the agent, like we discussed before, is going to be very simple, where right? so you have this expectation um, over the entire trajectory. So this is this agent I. So it's a discounted reward where a, a here is the action that I'm taking in time step T and S is the state that I'm in. Okay, and I want to basically define this reward this way, the usual way. And at each time step t, kind of going back to that, this is the rata that we talked about before. Um, I'm defining the reward as you know reaching the destination at time step t um, minus I'm giving like the same kind of penalty, colliding for the first time with an obstacle at time step t. And then uh, distance to the goal. So I want to get there as fast as possible, but somehow normalize distance to the goal. And we added this kind of regularization loss here with ACE, kind of saying that this drive has to be smooth. So the actions have to be similar. And the multi agent reward here is just a sum across all agents, right? So we're kind of optimizing this joint utilitarian reward. And we want to find the policy, the shared policy that maximizes this objective. And we're gonna use the PPO algorithm for this. So there is no real technical novelty here in terms of you know how we're kind of approaching this problem. What really kind of we wanna investigate here is if we define driving this way, what kind of behavior emerges? So let's look at what actually happens. So here we had a very simple environment, which is basically just a four-way intersection. And uh, the agents start on one side and their goal destination is on the other side of the road. And we're going to have different number of agents starting from different road sleeves. And here we're just kind of analyzing the, the emergent behaviors that happen after all the training. Um, so the colors here are going to represent fraction of agents seeing the green signal. So we're going to place, you know, like a traffic light on each uh, intersection uh, side over here where there is no meaning of re red light. It's just a token that the agent sees, which is like on or off the token. And basically, we're going to try to analyze whether this agent, as a result of this optimization, start to pay attention to that traffic light, just because that helps them optimize their very simple objective. OK, so basically, reading this legend, the most green I am, the most I'm paying attention to the traffic light. Um, so let's try to read this plot here. So here in the top left, we have only a single agent. And obviously, a single agent doesn't need to pay attention to the traffic light. So there is basically like, is a you know, random chance of it paying attention to the traffic light. But here, as I'm increasing the number of agents, they're trying to pay attention more and more to the traffic light. So here in the middle center, so here in the intersection, if this is very green, that means that all these agents actually only crossed over if there was a green light. So they started paying attention to the green light. So basically, the more agent I have, the more they pay attention to the traffic uh, sign. And kind of a similar situation happens here. So here I have four agents when I'm adding LiDAR noise. 
from you know no lidar noise you have these plots are basically matching they're obeying they're still paying attention to traffic lights the more blind i'm making them so 100 percent lidar noise basically means they're random they're blind the more they're just paying attention to traffic lights which is kind of great right because basically a rule of using a traffic light is emerging as a result of this optimization problem. Here is just showing some rollouts of you know these learned behaviors. And again, here I have these four agents with zero lighter noise. And if you observe this long enough, you see that sometimes they don't pay attention to traffic lights. And the more the more agents there are, the more they're actually gonna obey um, and, and stop at a traffic light. Cool. And we have even taken that policy that was trained on like this very simple environments and rolling out on this a little bit more complicated new scenes uh, patch. And it turns out that, that it kind of works. So it was also started paying attention to traffic lights here without ever us specifying the reward function associated with it. Cool. Um, all right, so the next one, of course, is going to be following lanes, right? We know that rows have lanes. So the question is, does this also emerge in this very simple environment? So if you look at here with four agents, um, I, I don't think there was any uh, LiDAR noise over here. You can see that they kind of have this, you know, not lane-like um, behavior, right? So it starts somewhere here, but then it crosses over and goes on the other side, just because there is no other agent on the other side that would kind of obscure their path. Here on the right, as I'm increasing the number of agents, I think here we have over four of, uh, sorry, uh, eight agents. If you look at this carefully, you can actually see that they're starting to really pay attention to uh, to lanes. So here is maybe a better realization. So this is just aggregating many, many different rollouts and looking at their trajectories. So you can really see that you know, without specifying any reward for lanes, they learn how to follow lanes just because that optimizes a joint reward, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, here is another fun experiment. This is an emergence of fast lanes. So here we're making some agents have a higher possible max velocity and some agents are gonna be slower. So here dark, darker um, purple, I guess, denotes cars that can be faster. And you can see that again, lanes emerge. So they all start on a lane. Lanes again emerge. And the faster cars tend to go here in the bottom. Thus, and they cluster together, and the slower are in the top. And again, they cluster together, which is kind of similar to how highway, highways are built, where right? there's always like a fast lane. This is perhaps less visible over here, but we try to scale this to a little bit more complicated um, environment. So this is taking patches from new scenes, which is a real driving data set and uh, giving you know, some traffic lights and again, optimizing the same uh, reward function. And what happens is that this agent start paying attention to the safety distance, right? Because as, as you're increasing the number of agents, they, if they don't pay attention to safety distance to the car just in front of them, they're gonna start colliding. And another, and another kind of aspect that we notice is there's a slight notion of right of way. So if I'm the first one to enter the intersection, you're also likely to exit it first, uh, which was really kind of cool to see. So this plot might not be the best to visualize this, but there is somehow a plot that maybe shows this a little bit more. So here on the, x-axis, I have distance to the car in front of me. On, on the y-axis, there's like a speed matching that distance, right? So if I'm going at a particular distance, what should be kind of my, my speed match distance to not collide with the car in front of me? So safe stopping so that I match that velocity of the car just in front of me. So basically this means that here, this diagonal over here and uh, this green triangle so if the point is in this green triangle, I have a safe distance, okay? Um, so on the right side is this RL train agents. On the left side is the, the real agents. So these are humans. And we did the analysis on just new scenes trajectories. So what, what, hap what kind of you can see over here is that even humans don't always have perfect safety distance. So they're kind of assuming that the car in front of them is not gonna just quickly break. Um, and uh, the, in the RL environment, 
the agent also pay attention to safety distance, but maybe less so. There is more violations over here. I'm not exactly sure why. Probably we should just add a lot more agents, uh, or maybe optimization needs to be done somehow better. But this was kind of cool. So this was just you know our first step on this direction of just how far can you go by training these RL agents with just very simple objectives without needing to engineer all those reward functions. So the next step is really kind of scaling this up to a lot more agents, a lot more complicated environments and, and just see where we land. And you know, there are certain rules that I can see how it's gonna be hard to emerge like uh, speed limits. And maybe we need some uh, rewards for that, but I, I think this is a, actually a pretty promising direction over here. Um, all this project that you see here is released. So the environment, the code, everything is released. So I'm really inviting you to, to work on this and, and play with this environment, um, particularly if you're an expert on RL. Cool. So I'm going to switch gear a little bit here. So this was really about, you know, how do I model those traffic uh, in, in like a graphics environment. Here, we're gonna try to train a neural simulator. We're gonna train everything from scratch from pixels directly, right? In driving, I'm collecting so much data on the road. And once my platform is, 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 is basically built, it's easy to collect data. I just go out and record, right? So the question really here is going to be, can I build a model of the environment um, directly from pixels, right? Kind of sidestep all that development of the game engines. All right, so we're calling this neural simulation. Uh, and our first uh, take on this was this game game, where the idea was that can we, like in, in game engines, you basically have a, you know, an action that the user can make. And then there's the game engine that's going to paint the frame as a reaction to that action, right? And our question was, can we completely replace that game engine or uh, with a neural net? So a neural network basically mimicking what's happening inside that game engine. Okay, so we're imagining this, this game and over here receiving an action from the user. So it's, there's still gonna be a player in the loop that's gonna play the game, but the neural network is going to be painting the frames. And they're gonna learn how to paint these uh, frames by basically looking at trajectory samples from real games. Okay, so you're gonna say, what? Why do I even need to do that? I mean, there is already a game engine, right? And you know, this is the first toy task that we should at least be testing against. I think where this is really going to be powerful is where you don't have access to the game engine, right? the real world, right? If you guys have watched the Matrix, maybe there's an existence of a Matrix, and we're hoping that this game gun is gonna recover that Matrix. All right, so. You know, the first design for this model uh, was, was, was very simple. It was basically this LSTM that would receive an action at each time step, some random noise and the previous uh, generated image. It would process, produce a latent uh, state, then throw this into some synthesis network that would produce the next frame. And we also had this like nice uh, memory module, which you can think of as uh, you know, like a, some sort of a map of the environment that the, the neural network is able to build as it's exploring the environment. So, you know, kind of building a mental model of the of the maze or the of, or the map, basically reading and writing in this additional memory spatial memory structure. All right, how we were training this? I mean, there is not a big rocket science. So, you know, there's a single frame discriminator trying to make sure this image is uh, looking realistic. Temporal discriminator is looking a bunch of frames, making sure that the trajectory of this frame is realistic. And in order to actually pay attention to the action, we have this action condition discriminator, which takes two consecutive frames and tries to infer back the action, meaning that I have to actually be generating uh, images in a way to respect this action. Okay, so here is one result in this like ego Pac-Man uh, environment. And all this that we're seeing here, so there is a sync with the author, the main author, and this is playing this game, but the frames here is painted by, by game gun. Okay, so this was pretty cool. Um, and I wanted to show that this is not an easy task. It seems so easy. Okay, fine, there is this Pac-Man painted. We started with stuff that looked like much, much, much worse. So here is some results from the early development 
of this uh, of this game gun. And so here is on the left. And um, you know one, one thing to notice is it's extremely hard to generate a ghost. <laughs> Everything looked a little bit more blurry and it was hard to produce the ghost. So you know we were really chasing ghosts for quite a, some time in this uh, project. So we kind of narrow down the scope at the time, make a much smaller environment and debug here. So here was like some intermediate result. So here the ghosts are appearing, it's much easier to paint them, I can always see them. But it was so hard for this Pac-Man to learn the rules of the game, like it would not die. It would, did not learn a concept that if it you know, catches this, uh, this red ghost, it would die, nothing really happened. So making Pac-Man die was the next, um, <laughs> next part of the development process. But you know we did quite well, so we actually released this model for the exact 40th anniversary anniversary of Pac-Man, and people kind of really love that. So here is this promo video, and it's also showing like the latest results uh, of of Game Gun. I'll just play this. So here you can see, uh, you could have seen that, you know, it kind of learned how to paint the ghost color, change the ghost color, eat Pac-Man, and then it would disappear. And um, and the, f the food was disappearing as the Pac-Man was traveling around. Oops. So this is a fun video that I saw someone post two days ago. And we basically released the source code and someone just trained this uh, game gun on the Grand Theft Auto. Okay, and you know, I'm just gonna play their video here because I thought it's quite hilarious. Welcome, everyone, Theft Auto. What you see here is me playing inside of a neural network's environment. This neural network was trained by watching a bot play Grand Theft Auto 5 on this particular stretch of highway, learning how to generate new frames from previous frames and player input. So every pixel you see here is generated from a neural network while I play. While generating the visuals or just improving them is interesting too, and there has been some interesting work lately with neural networks improving the visuals with Grand Theft Auto V in particular in attempts to make it look more photorealistic, this is something much more than that. The neural network in this case is the entire game. It's handling what happens when you press a key. This goes for like 17 minutes. I'm not going to play. In two days, it got 140,000 views and a lot of positive comments. So I, I was super excited. And of course, I was also a little bit, um, you know, feeling tiny because this, this quality is actually not as good as one would hope for. Um, but, but here is a good thing for us. We have been actually thinking about this use case ever since we published Game Gun. And really kind of we wanted to scale that particular project to more complicated environment you know grand theft auto is is one example but basically for driving and here we're basically trying to train this new model called drive gun on the carla uh, simulator and even more complicated carla simulators here with many uh, different objects also present in the scene and again the user is controlling the wheel here the speed and this is being synthesized not perfect, but it seems like you know it's doing a good job. So, so let me tell you a little bit about what we've done here. So the model is similar to as before. So there's still going to be some some dynamic engine that takes in an image and an action, but we're gonna try to scale this entire pipeline to this more uh, advanced generator. In particular, we want to take uh, advantage of Stalgan as you know maybe the the state of the art image generator. Okay, so, you know, instead of here, our custom based network that we had before, we maybe want to plug this uh, like a Stalgen like architecture over here. And we felt that train this entire pipeline uh, would be a little bit hard on just a lot of videos. So we're pre training this part here with just like a simple, um, like a VAE GAN approach. So we're going to have an image that's going to train this encoder over here. It's going to produce two different codes. One is going to be a content code, so you know information about the environment, and one is going to be a theme code that you know, controls weather and maybe night day and so on. 
and uh, you know like VIE style here, so it's producing some distribution. And then we're taking that latent code and we're decoding here with style GAN like architecture into an image. So this is like VIE GAN, so it has you know the the GAN like so discriminator objective from style GAN, but then it also borrows the, the loss functions from VIEs. Okay. And uh, so we're basically pre-training this, which means that we have pre-trained this green part and the, the red part over here. And the, uh, when we're going to video, the, the real challenge is basically training this dynamics engine, but we're basically training the dynamics in the latent space, which we felt would maybe be easier. Um, okay, so, and there's a little bit of like key designs choices here that I'm gonna explain next. So here is just us kind of trying to train this uh, uh, this VIE style again on a single image. So here is um, what I'm showing on the right is the original image. And here is this VIE that's producing the latent code and then we're decoding it back to the, to the image. So, you know, I'm showing here what's the best reconstruction we can get by training this, this particular model over here. And this is using just this plain style again architecture, which means that this content code here is just 1D. And you know, it's kind of good, but at the same time, if you look at the details, it's not good. Like here, for example, for this car, I you know style has spaced a completely different car here. And some of these other cars is, are all gone in the reconstruction. The buildings are, are kind of weird and so on. So what the first real modification to Stalgan we've done is make this content code here spatial. So instead of just making it 1D, here is going to be a spatial co content code. And that improves things a lot. It doesn't perfectly solve them, but it improves things a lot. So you can see now these other vehicles starting to appear and there's maybe more consistency in the reconstruction. And this is pretty great because now what I can also do is have an image and an encoder that produces this latent code, which maybe we're gonna use this later for other tasks that I'm gonna talk about. So here is just the same result, but for real driving scene. So here are the input images, here are these reconstructions. And you know it's not perfect, but it's kind of trying to do a good job at at least understanding where the objects should be and you know what the semantic of the image is. Oh, here is one more example. Um, here I'm showing, you know, what different parts of this game can control. So here uh, on the x-axis, we are randomizing the theme vector. So you can see that, you know, at least here in the last row, we're basically controlling the weather or night and day by basically sampling a different theme vector. And uh, modifying the latent code is basically allowing you to click on some spatial block and plug and replace a different latent code in that block only which allows you to either delete something or maybe place another asset in a particular location. So let me just play this video over here that maybe is a nice visualization of this. And let me know where I need to stop. I think I should probably uh, finish my talk anytime. So here you can control different themes and you can paint different objects. So here I'm just maybe, and then we can stop here if the time is run out and just a longer rollout out of um, this drive again.